over the years, I've noticed that whenever I read this story or hear it read, we always put the emphasis in the message from the voice on the verb. We say, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. The implication, then, is that we, like Peter, are too busy trying to talk, to come up with answers, to fill the silence, or just calm ourselves down, that we have a hard time listening to what we're being told. But today, as I read this, I begin to wonder if we shouldn't instead be reading the verse with the emphasis on the direct object of the sentence. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. I mean, let's consider the scene here, right? Peter suddenly finds himself in the presence of Moses and Elijah, two of the most colossal figures in Jewish history. Imagine standing on the mall in Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden having George Washington and Abraham Lincoln standing beside you. Peter is absolutely starstruck. Here he is with his rabbi and the greatest lawgiver and the greatest prophet of all time. Of course, he wants to take advantage of their wisdom. He wants to sit at their feet and learn from them all that he can learn. He's so amazed by these historical celebrities that he somehow seems to become blind to the literally dazzling figure of his own rabbi standing right in front of him. The words from the cloud maybe aren't an admonition for him to stop talking and start listening, but a reminder to him of whom he ought to be paying attention to. I've heard a lot of people speculate over the years about what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about. Were they debating the finer points of the law or maybe commiserating over the burden of speaking to God's people on God's behalf? Some have thought that this scene demonstrates that Jesus is uh, as good as the, as on par as, with these great people from history. But I wonder if this story doesn't function a little bit like the story of Jesus as a temple, as a boy in the temple from uh, St. Luke's Gospel. Luke tells that story to show that even as a 12-year-old, Jesus had the knowledge and the authority to teach the teachers. Maybe here Mark is showing us that Jesus has the knowledge and the authority to teach even the greatest teachers of all time, that he is greater than Moses and Elijah. Peter is starstruck by meeting these great historical figures, but maybe the point of this story is that he ought to be more starstruck by the man he's already been following for nine chapters. It seems to me that, like Peter, our problem isn't listening. <clears throat> we try very, very hard to listen. To listen and to imitate and to extrapolate and to obey the wisdom that we find in Scripture. I think that we're actually pretty good at listening. The more pressing challenge is figuring out to whom we should be listening. We all of us have all kinds of teachers in our lives, past and present. Pastors and Sunday school teachers and preachers and theologians and Bible scholars and books, all very eager to tell us exactly what God wants us to do and how God wants us to do it. Unfortunately, you don't need to listen very long to figure out that many of these teachers disagree with one another. Even though we're all looking at the same source of authority, at the same Bible, we so often come away with very, very different conclusions about what is right and moral and just. Last week, our congregation undertook an exercise in listening. We took a seemingly simple question. What is the church's role in society? And we looked at three seemingly simple possibilities. <clears throat> One was that the church ought to be a place of refuge, a place where people can leave their differences at the door and come together over what we have in common. Another was that the church ought to be a place of mediation, a place where we can create a safe space to fairly consider all options and perspectives with curiosity and respect. The third was that the church ought to be a prophetic voice, confidently separating right from wrong and calling people to lead a holy and moral life. What we found as we listened was that this simple answer didn't, excuse me, this simple question didn't have any simple answers. We wrestled with these three possibilities, finding merits and drawbacks in all of them. And we wondered if they really needed to be mutually exclusive or if there was room for 
two or even three of them in the church's ministry at different times and in different places. We didn't come to, the, to a conclusion about what the role of our congregation should be in our society. But we did notice that regardless of whatever opinions we might have had about each option, <clears throat> we heard a lot of common motivations behind all of them. We all thought that the church ought to be a place that is open to as many people as possible. A place where people feel loved and respected and where everyone has a voice. We all wanted to remain true to our tradition and our identity as Christian people, while also respecting the dignity and the integrity of traditions and identities around us. We all wanted to do our best to follow the direction of God. Above all, there was a great concern for helping and caring for the people around us. Sometimes these motivations are best served by uh, being a refuge, focusing on what we have in common rather than what separates us. Sometimes by making room to discuss our differing opinions and interpretations of Scripture. Sometimes by taking a stand on what we believe to be non-negotiable, especially when it comes to protecting folks who've been marginalized and placed in vulnerable positions. We didn't think that the church should back down from the challenge of trying to address these problems of the world, but we saw that there are different ways to do that. We recognize that people come to the church from many different places in their faith journeys, and we hoped that the church might be able to provide a way for people in each place to engage in a way that was meaningful and true to who they felt God calling them to be. We arrived at these observations by listening, but it is to whom we were listening that makes this exercise valuable. It's my experience that we often want someone in a place of authority, a teacher or a pastor or a bishop, to tell us what the answers are. But those authorities can only tell us what they think and the conclusions to which they have come. In this exercise, we listen to each other. And when we listen to each other, we recognize the authority that each of us has from our own life experience, our education, our own faithful pondering these questions. It's not just the case that any one of us, not even teachers or pastors or bishops, have the overwhelming authority of Moses or Elijah. What we do have together is the authority of Jesus. Authority that comes not from knowledge or experience or expertise, but from our connection to God through the Holy Spirit. When we come together as a church, we are transfigured. The whole becomes more than the sum of its parts. We become more than just a collection of individuals. We become a collection of individuals washed in baptism and sharing a common calling. In other words, we become a collection of individuals in whom God is at work. The Spirit moves among us as we interact with one another, as we learn from and teach each other, and as we grow both as individuals and as a community. Somewhere in those interactions, in the spaces between us, God is at work moving us in the direction God wants us to go. It's a messy process, and it's terribly inefficient. But for better or for worse, that's the process which God has chosen to bring us closer to God's vision of wholeness. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we make horrible mistakes and people get hurt. But it's the best way that we have to listen to God. It's the process God has chosen to bring us closer to God's vision of wholeness. The vision that Jesus called the kingdom of God. Although we did not decide on what role our congregation should take in society, we did decide that having that conversation is valuable. What this tells me is that that might be where God is calling us now, to be in conversation with one another about this and other things. We are so hungry to listen and I think that we began to recognize the voice of God in that act of listening to our community. Of course, our listening is not perfect, in part because our community is not perfect. We recognize that as we deliberated, that there are voices that are not in that conversation with us. 
we are a congregation composed primarily of older, privileged white people. We wondered in our time together what perspectives and wisdom might be added by inviting other voices belonging to younger adults and children, people living in the margins, people of color. I also heard people reflect on the reality that we are not always very good at inviting people in general. And we wonder how we might do better. I find that last question particularly edifying because whenever we in the church start to talk about inviting others into our congregations, it's always in the context of growing our membership or our giving base or supporting our ministries. But what if instead we were to think about how those we invite might change our congregations, might be a part of creating new ministries or new patterns, might even change how we experience church entirely. What if inviting others into our congregation might be God's way of transfiguring our entire concept of what the church is and does, how it operates, making it brighter than anyone on earth could possibly make it? That thought scares us as much as that moment on the mountain scared Peter and James and John. But what if that is where Jesus is calling us, leading us up the mountain apart by ourselves? Shouldn't we listen to him rather than our own instincts to build more sanctuaries and classrooms? I'll admit that that conversation last week didn't quite go how I expected it to go. There's a lot of things that I would have changed if I could have. But that's part of what makes this so great to experience. Even though it didn't go quite how I thought it should, the Holy Spirit was there moving among us, helping us to think and change and grow, transfiguring us all into something new. I'm excited to continue that conversation with you all, to invite new voices into that conversation. I'm excited by the prospect of finding uh, where we might end up, but also how we might get there. And perhaps most importantly, who we might become in the process.